I'm starting with the science of Sunnah, not the science of the Quran. A lot of traditional schools, they start with Aqidah, with Creed. Um, they start with creed because they, uh, in order to um, uh, to give their respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they all want to start about how we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is the most important thing, which is great. However, uh, theoretically that sounds excellent, the right approach, but when it comes to studying, if there is so much background you need in order to study Aqidah, that I have Done, I, I'm going to do that like after we study uh, Sunnah and the Quran, and then we're going to come to the Aqidah. The reason is because Islamic history is important, Sira is important, all of this, it has a lot of prerequisites before any of that is going to make sense to you. And why are the, the uh, ulama of Aqidah saying what they're saying? Okay? Um, you know, we, we read from their benefits, we, we know what our Aqidah is, but. Uh, it, they, they've gone through, there's been a lot of bloodshed, a lot of arguments, centuries of work that has gone into what would be just quickly read. Um, and and uh, this is what our dean says, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of sacrifices that have gone in to even create that, okay? All right, um, I'm not preaching, I'm just helping you think, okay? So if I get too preachy, stop me. That's not my purpose, okay. So, Sunnah. Um, there's the science called Hujiyat Sunnah. And why did this become important? It, the, the, it became important because uh, in nowadays times where people said, oh, a, uh, Hadith is not preserved, Sunnah is not preserved, because they haven't studied, they haven't looked into it, right? So they feel only Quran is preserved, so I'm just going to ignore the Sunnah. Okay, so a lot of scholars, they uh, spent a lot of time delving into proving the authority of the Sunnah. Okay, and by the way, it doesn't take a rocket science to prove the authority of the Sunnah. You read the Quran a couple of pages and you see the authority of the Sunnah. It's literally that simple. However, so we're going we're gonna to delve deeper into, like you, can't, you cannot believe in the Quran and not believe in the Sunnah. You just, it's just impossible. Okay, impossible. Um, and we shall see why. Okay, all right. So uh, this is called Fujiyat Sunnah, the absolute proof of the importance and the significance of Sunnah. What is Sunnah? Is Hadith Sunnah? Is that the only Sunnah? What is Sunnah? We pray Sunnah prayers. Isn't that Sunnah too? What What's the difference between a Hadith Sunnah and a Sunnah prayer? What's the difference? That's what we will study today, inshallah. Okay? So, sunnah. What does sunnah mean? Okay? Allah has a sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, it's my sunnah. Sunnah to Allah. What sunnah does Allah have? Sunnah linguistically means a tradition. A, something that you do. A hab habitual thing that you always do. That's your methodology that you always do. Okay? For example, I get up in the morning and the first thing I do is I wash my hands every single morning. That's the first thing I do because, you know, I'm a little bit OCD and I'm just gonna go and uh, wash my hands. That's, that's my sunnah. Is that valid to say? Absolutely valid to say, no problem. Okay, that's your sunnah, no problem. So that's the word sunnah, good? Okay, that's what it linguistically means. Now, when scholars of science use the word sunnah, they uh, use it in context. Okay, so generally, like what I, the example I gave you is a general usage of the sunnah, of the term sunnah, okay? A practice, somebody's practice, okay? When it's used uh, specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, it means the will of Allah, the qadr qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants out of us, that's his sunnah, right? Of what he does, the way he creates, the way he maintains, the way he has is our rub, uh, his um, attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's his sunnah. So in, when it comes to the matter of aqidah, okay, these are the essential elements of what our beliefs are, right? What uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put angels for a reason, jinn for a reason, he created evil for a reason, you know, all of this stuff. This is all sunnah to Allah. 
So when you say Sunnah of Allah, in the that's what you mean in the Aqidah realm. Okay, clear? Okay. In the Fiqh realm, what is Fiqh? What is Fiqh? Fiqh is a you know, how do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, so in that realm, sunnah is like the sunnah prayer. Inshallah, when we get to fiqh, you'll actually understand sunnah prayer. What does it even mean? Okay, what do I mean by sunnah prayer? Okay, when it comes to hadith, okay, it is sunnah is not just, ha it, I'm sorry, yes, I, yes and no. When it comes to hadith, sunnah is the, uh, what we know Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be like, his approach, his methodology, not just what he said, not just what he did, not just what he approved, not what he just disapproved. How his demeanor was, how his character was, how people saw him, how uh, you, uh, how uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how. Uh, uh, the, the, he created the impact, right? What did he prioritize? What did he not prioritize? Prioritize, yeah? What, uh, and also, so a lot of this, how did he recite the Quran? How long did he grow his beard? This is called Shaman. We'll, we'll talk about that, inshallah. Um, uh, that's all his sunnah, okay? Um, a lot of this, and I was just having a discussion with another scholar on this, um, and uh, pretty much, if it's not in the hadith that you find, scholars have actually documented and extracted some of this, it's like, if you look, this is what Rasulullah did. He always, for example, he always, given two choices, he always picked the easy one, right, we all know this one. Um, when he entered a, a room, he always entered with his right foot. Right? That, that's his sunnah. That, you understand now the difference between what we traditionally think of sunnah and what I'm trying to say? Okay. There's more. How did he do wudu? Okay. So you can read a book and it's like, okay, you're supposed to do the mad baba and you're supposed to do the, uh, you put the water in your nose and how he actually did it. So there is Sunnah Maktuba, so there's written Sunnah, either there's a hadith directly from Rasulullah or the, the, what the companions told us how Rasulullah uh, used to do something, or the successors to, who heard from the companions who saw, who, who saw Rasulullah do their opinions, okay? Um, but you can only write so much down. For example, the art of recitation of the Quran. Is that, can you write that down? How you recite and pronounce the letter A, B, you can. Scholars have tried to write that down, okay? Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. But there are sunnah that you don't know how somebody is until you experience them, you have a relationship with them, right? Uh, you can, if, if I ask you to write a book on your dad, you can probably write a book on your dad, that's fine. Um, but is that going to do justice to your father? No. No. So this should give us uh, humility. One humility is we can only so, know so much about someone. In this case. And there's a lot of things we can't know. But the way we get our hints from how we can know is following the sunnah of the companions, Khulafa Rashidun first and foremost, then some of the other Sahaba, then after the era of the Sahaba, they all passed away, then the uh, era, of, uh, era of the successors, the followers, the Tabi'een and the Tabi'ah Tabi'een, and how they heard Rasulullah did wudu, for example, or how did it feel to be with him, right? So have this humility. Hadith itself, and what other scholars have written, you. It can give you, paint a picture, but it still will have holes in it, okay? So what later on scholars have done, and this happened relatively modern, where they've kind of derived rules and principles, guiding principles, okay? And we will look into that later on, inshallah, but I don't want to go off too deep right now. I'm just giving you an idea of sunnah. What is sunnah? So hopefully now, 
the term sunnah is much broader than you probably ever thought. In summary, sunnah is a way of life, and it's used in different contexts differently. In fiqh, it is the like the what what things are recommended. We will learn learn about that. In in the hadith, it's it's hadith, but it's more than the hadith. Like I told you, talk about things that you just know from um, the other sources, etc. Okay. Then, like, and I've already covered this. It's it, when it turn, it's used in the term of usul frameworks methodology. Then it is guidelines and principles. What did he prioritize? Rasulullah didn't always say Rasulullah didn't always say that uh, 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 these are the priorities you should follow. Clearly, right? But it's derived. It's derived from reading all the hadith and what everybody else said about Rasulullah and what he prioritized. So you, you, uh, so when the usulis. The people of the framework, when they talk about sunnah, that's what they're talking about. It's the guidelines, the principles, and the approach. Okay, so we, we're good with the definition of sunnah. We just covered the definition of the sunnah right now. Now we're going to talk about khujji of the sunnah, the authority of the sunnah. Like I told you, you can't read a couple of pages of the Quran and not, not realize the khujji uh, of the sunnah, the importance of the sunnah, the significance of the sunnah. Uh, those who uh, don't uh, believe in, um, uh, in, in the sunnah, and there's uh, that can be argued, there's nobody like that unless they call themselves Muslim. Um, you, uh, so, uh, Quran is full of authority of the Sunnah. And how? We'll just look at uh, some examples. Numerous ayat in the Quran, I say 25 plus, these are direct ayat. Indirectly, the Quran is full of Hujiyat the Sunnah. Okay? Um, Rasulullah is, is a representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's his purpose. He's a Nabi of Allah. He's Rasulullah. Rasul, what does the word Rasul mean? Messenger of Allah. His job is to impart the message. How can he not have authority? How can he take that away? Where do you get the Quran from? It is from his authority. Remember our sources of knowledge and all of that? Is Rasulullah an authoritative source? Yes. If you are a believer, right? You, it's an authoritative source. If you're a non-believer, then you're going to study about his life and see how, how he was. Before Islam, for example, people used to call him Sadiq, Amin, right? Truthful, trustworthy. Okay, so this, there's something to that, you know? And you look at his life story, and you look at, uh, look at his uh, uh, seerah, and, and how he treated people before and after, how, how he didn't amass wealth for himself, and his whole purpose was just to, um, uh, just to enrich the ummah. That was his purpose, okay? Um, I have been sent to do nothing except to elevate human character, to excel human character. That was his purpose. Okay. So, anyways, um, uh, so authority of the Sunnah. So, Quran over and over in so many ayat says, "Follow Rasulullah." Allah wa Rasul. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. All over the place. In some places, if you want to, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Rasulullah, tell them, if you claim to love Allah, then follow me. Which means the path to following Allah is through Rasulullah, right? Okay. Again, I'm not, pre I'm not preaching. I'm just telling you what, the, what is the Quran saying about this sunnah, okay? Um, um, accepting the decisions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very, very important. Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that unless and until these folk don't use you as the judge for any matter, then, uh, then, uh, then they are not um, earning the pleasure of Allah. So we are asked to use Rasulullah as a judge. So when he was around, you use him if you have a disagreement. Mm -hmm. When he's not around, what do we do? We use his sunnah, not just the hadith, right? Remember? Yeah. We use the sunnah, right? For some people, hadith is just a sunnah, and that's their methodology. For other usulis, and I'm from among them, trying to be, um, Wannabe, um, I, I, I'm taking the, 
the usuri approach of sunnah. It's not just what's documented, it's more than that, okay? okay. Imam Suyuti, for example, was one of the, uh, one of the biggest usuris. Okay, so uh, I, think, I think that's, that's sufficient here. Um, Surat Hujurat actually, uh, um, can I be a little bit preachy? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Really? Yeah, why not? Okay. Surat Hujurat, you know, everybody should read that surah. Everybody to go on YouTube, listen to your lecture. Everybody should read that surah. If you have, if you have, if you don't know what I'm talking about, when you read that surah, you're you're gonna be a different person walking out. Okay, I highly, highly recommend you read Surah Hujurat. Okay, um, so we're just gonna do a few ayat of it in the beginning, inshallah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. So, uh, by the way, what is Hujurat? So if you know Masjid al-Nabawi, yeah, I'll, I have a, alhamdulillah, I have a board here, Barakul Gafiq for uh, Jamil Bhai for doing this. So this is the Masjid, I'm drawing it in 3D a little bit. Masjid al-Nabawi, right? Walls, it has doors on this side and this side, and there were many, many doors on this side. This is the Qibla right here, right? So when you go to the Rawda in Masjid al-Nabawi, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? You go in this area. This is the Rawda. Okay? And you see the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, what is it called? The dome? The green dome? It's here on this side. It's on this side. Right? It's on this side. Right here. When you go to the Rawda, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the house of Aisha is to over here. So the first house was the house of Aisha, the first house. Yes, it was the first house. Hujurat were these apartments that Rasulullah made for his, for our mothers, for Ummahat al Mu'min. Okay? These were the houses. These are the Hujurat. The apartments. It means the apartments. So, all of the wives of Rasulullah, I mean, there were some houses in the back as well. And Rasulullah used to come in and out from here, directly go, leave the salah. Right here. Yes. Question. How many apartments are there? Uh, I think there are a good number. At least 8 to 10, something like that. Lots of apartments. Did all the wives of Rasulullah lived in, lived in these hujurat? No. There were some that were in other places. Okay? Uh, as well. Okay. And uh, Fatima, radiallahu anha, did she live here? Uh, no. She, she lived um, somewhere else. Okay? All right. So this is, this is how, when you read the hadith, keep this picture in mind. When, whenever, uh, for example, you, you read the stories about the death of Rasulullah um, or you read about how he, you know, uh, walked to the masjid all wet because he just done ghusl, for example, just keep this picture in mind, it's gonna make a lot of sense. Okay, so this is Hujurat, now back to Surah Hujurat. Um, all right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَعَوْدِ بِاللَّهِ مِنِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O believers, all those of you who claim to believe, if you claim to believe, لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Do not prioritize above Allah and His Messenger. Meaning, it's an open statement. Meaning, you cannot prioritize anything above Allah and His Messenger. It's an open statement. لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ uh, يَدَيِ اللَّهِ meaning in front of Allah. So, you, there is no priority more important than Allah and the Messenger. What taqullah and fear Allah. Have consciousness of Allah. What are you doing? By the way, what was going on? Let me tell you a little bit of the story. So I, I can't. I don't know for a fact if there was a boundary wall around here to protect the hujurat. We don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't want to say we don't know. I don't know. Um, but so so people. If, if, if we're in Medina, and, we, and we're Muslims, and we love Rasulullah you think we want to spend time with him all the time? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't prioritize anything up, uh, above Allah and his messenger, and I believe that. I'm gonna do everything that I can to be with him all the time. He's a human being. He has needs, he wants to eat, he wants to spend time with his family. So how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people were coming and shouting, Ya Rasulullah, I have a question for you. Ya Rasulullah, shouting, right? Can you please come out? 
That's what they were doing. This is when this surah was revealed. Okay? So look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this high station. You'd be blown away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah samiyun alim. Allah is hearing um, and knowing of everything, which means whatever you're doing, whatever you're prioritizing above the Prophet, I know, right? Ya ladina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawfa sarfin nabi. All those of you believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of Rasulullah. Allah, you can't, you can't be louder than Rasulullah. Rasulullah, did he speak loudly? No, he spoke, he probably spoke really softly. Out of respect, several ulama, when they read a hadith, they read it in a really soft tone because that's something Rasulullah said. So they don't, they, out of respect of this ayah, they don't raise their voices even when reading hadith, right? They were shouting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, why are you raising your voices above us? Look at the respect, right? Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to Rasulullah in the Quran. And don't talk loudly to him. Just like you talk to each other in a loud voice, and like, hey brother, how are you doing? You don't talk to Rasulullah like that. You, no, you have to talk to him with respect. This is the Quran telling us, how we need to behave in, uh, with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, if you were to do that, an tahbata amalukum, all of your good deeds are gonna go to waste if you do that. Doesn't matter how good you are, if you raise your voice in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or talk to him like you talk to any other human being, then all your good deeds are gonna go to waste. That's what Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying. Think about this. Before Nubuwa. Before Rasulullah got prophethood, um, Abu Bakr was his best friend, right? Khadija radiAllahu anha, wife. How do you think they they would have uh, dealt with each other? Like normal husband and wife, like normal friends. After Nubuwa, after they believed, you look at every single hadith. Guess what Abu Bakr used to call call him. Rasulullah. He didn't say my friend. What did Khadija radiallahu anha call him? Rasulullah. Do you see? It's very powerful. You won't see this written anywhere. This is all implied. Do you understand? So implied sunnah. Do you know? It's not written anywhere. Okay. Um, so you guys get the idea. Um, those who lower their voices in front of Rasulullah those are the ones that are actually have taqwa. I'm just summarizing. Those are the ones who actually fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lahum maghfirah. For them is forgiveness. Wa ajrun azim. And a great reward, meaning Jannah. Okay? Inna ladina yunadunaka min wara'i al-hujurat. Those who are Screaming from behind the Qujarat, right? Aftaruhum la yaqilum. Most of them, they have, they don't have a brain. Yeah. Anyway, it's on and on. Okay. So, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaks about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. Ujiyat al Sunnah. Just the first passage of Surah Qujarat. I know, I know. Now I understand. Okay, now I really know. Okay? Um, okay, so nothing is a priority above the Prophet. Now you hopefully have experienced what this one little bullet means, right? Hopefully, inshallah. Okay, evidence of the hadith. There's many evidence of the uh, authority of Rasulullah. We don't need to go into that. But one thing I do want you to know is the Sunnah is. The Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And he also said Follow the Sunnah of My companions Follow the Sunnah of And we're going to dive into that now uh, Inshallah in a bit Dive in, uh, sorry uh, Follow the Sunnah of the Righteous successors that come after me The righteous successors He qualified it Okay, this is why we call the The first four uh, Khalifa Khulafa Rashidun Rashid, what does Rashid mean? Guided, rightly guided. 
That's why it's called Khulafa Rashidun, the rightly guided, guided caliphs. This, this is the word from Rasulullah. Okay? I don't have the hadith references here. I'm not, my memory is horrible, so I'm sorry I'm not able to repeat some of those words. Uh, but I can certainly look up if you're interested and I can share with you later. Um, let me know. Um, so follow the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. And he also said the best generations are the first three generations. He also said that. Meaning what? We should prioritize the first generation. And then the, uh, he, he said it. Uh, uh, what was, what's the uh, hadith? Uh, um, yeah. The first, the best generation is my generation. This is these are the words called Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. خير القرون قرني والذين يلونهم والذين يلي أو كما أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Or however he said it. Um, hadith is trans, uh, transmitted in not exact wordings. It's often transmitted in meaning. Okay, we will learn about that inshallah. He said. The best generation is my generation, then the generation following it, then the generation following it, which is the first three generations. Um, how, what is a generation? Is it 50 years, 100 years? No. So how did scholars define the generation? They said, okay, first generation is the generation of the companions, the Sahaba Karam, radiallahu anhu majma'in, right? That generation. The next generation is what? The tabi'in, the word, what, what does that mean? The followers, the followers of the companions. They didn't meet Rasulullah, but they followed him. But they followed the companions. So they're called Tabi'in. And the, and the generation after that is called Tabi' Tabi'in. The followers of the followers, also known as successors. Okay? Um, in this whole document, I'm going to use the word um, follower and successor interchangeably, okay? Because I didn't want to divide. Them. But basically, that's what he said. So his sunnah, he said, extends beyond him. You understand? Because again, he knew that not everything is written down, not everything can be documented. Um, so where do you learn the sunnah from? You learn the sunnah from the best three generations. Especially starting with the Khulafa al-Rashidah, the Khilafa al-Rashidah, the uh, righteous caliphate. Okay, sorry, I think I'm going in preachy line. I need to come back. Um, okay, so rejecting the sunnah. Should we spend time on this? It's actually silly to reject the sunnah. Because you, you basically are out of the fold of Islam. But people don't really reject the Sunnah. What, what are people doing? They are, um, they have concerns. They have, a, a hadith is not preserved. Okay, again, this is not a feel-good class. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really raw here and tell you how it really is. Okay, because my goal is to actually raise awareness so that you're not, you're not just drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm not here giving you Kool-Aid. Um, okay. We will drink it. 